Before I hand over to the next speaker, I'd just like to uh, give you a bit of background to today. Um, and as you know, we've called this an East Anglia Information Day. And four of our groups have got together, four of the Lupus UK regional groups have got together to put this day on. And I don't think that um, it would have been the success that it already has been without the work of the people that are behind this. So particularly Sheila Cheesman, who's here somewhere, probably now hiding, uh, and, and her committee in Cambridgeshire, Rob Dewson in Northamptonshire and, and his band of merry people, uh, and Bob Hale from Suffolk, uh, who also has been heavily involved in this uh, setup. And we've also had some input from the team in Norfolk as well. So thank them for, for today and for, for persuading our speakers to come here um, and for arranging everything to, to be set up as it is. There is a video being taken of today, which will be available for everybody at a later date. So if there's something that you've heard that you just want to go back on, then that will be made available as well. So thank you to the organising committee again for all of our speakers and to you for making the day a success. OK, I'd now like to hand over to Julie Birkin, who's an occupational therapist at Addenbrooke's Hospital, about making most of your energy and managing stress. So I think everybody can get something from this. Thank you. Hello everybody and it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon to speak with you. Um, I'm aware that 20 minutes isn't actually a very long time to cover the topics of fatigue and stress so it will be a whistle stop tour and some practical tips hopefully that you can take away today as well. I'm also aware that fatigue, in terms of fatigue, you're probably more of an expert at speaking on this topic than I am so it's really just some information and tips. Um, there may be things that are there for people that we find really useful, other things that you're doing already. So perhaps in the tea break it would be really helpful and really interesting to hear your um, tips for me as well to add to this. I'm an occupational therapist, as has been said, and I work at Addenbrooke's Hospital. And we, as part of that, we run a fatigue management group, but it's not specifically for people with lupus. It's a different kind of fatigue. So we've used some of the strategies today to help with that. So we know, and as you all know, that fatigue is one of the most common symptoms, uh, as, has, as has been said previously as well, of lupus. And it's also influenced by a number of factors, so whether you're experiencing any pain, your sleep patterns, mood, how you're feeling, um, also any medications as well, it can be influenced by, by flare-ups, and also um, the support around you as well, and your routines and the things that you have to do. And we know that there's a physical and a mental component to fatigue as well, which can be very um, disabling at times. And it's often difficult to define or describe, so we know um, that it's often underreported also. It's something that you may feel that you just have to get on with, it's part of things. Um, but it's really worth mentioning the fatigue because then we, there are some things that we can do about it. And it has a variable pattern as well. And what's one thing that struck me with, you know, with um, fatigue associated with lupus is often people say it will come at any time, there is no warning, it will just be there. So one minute you find, you know, you're okay and the next minute you're feeling fatigued. So that it can come without warning and it has variable patterns. And it may not be possible to remove the fatigue or relieve the fatigue completely, but what we're hoping to do is look at ways and, and develop techniques that can help to regain some of the control over fatigue, so it feels like you're more in control of it rather than f the fatigue controlling you. So it might be a bit of a strange photo to put up there, um, but we often... Um, fall into categories of, um, or can fall into a pattern of all or nothing. And by this I mean, you know, how often do you have a good day, you think, right, I'm going to go for it today, I'm going to do things today because I feel good. I'm going to, you know, I feel good at this time, so I'm really going to go and do things. You go all out, do lots of things, and then there might be a period of time after that time when there's a, like, there's a drop. You've got no energy, you feel absolutely exhausted, worn out, you've used up all your energy. And then you have that for a period of time, and then you think, actually, feeling a bit good again now, I'm going to go all out, I'm going to do what I can, I've got to fit it in before I get the next bout of feeling really fatigued again. So you go for it again, you do that all bit, and then it's like, boom, nothing again afterwards. So there's this all or nothing pattern of, of activity, which actually, over time, can wear you out quite a bit. So what we try and encourage is, rather 
with a nor or nothing is this is supposed to be gentle rolling hills by the way um, which will hope helpfully hope with the relaxation later on um, but what we're wanting to do is rather avoid this all or nothing pattern of activity so not going all out pushing it too far and then having that period of exhaustion rather get a, um, a more gentle level of activity so perhaps on a better day holding back a bit, not doing quite so much, but then on a not so good day of the days following, you'll find you'll actually be able to do a bit more because over time you'll have a more even pattern of activity rather than this all or nothing pattern which actually will be more destructive in the long run. You might think, like to think of things as an energy jug. So you've got a jar or a jug of energy. There are some things that will restore your energy. So some things like um, often art and craft activities, relaxation, some effective rest can actually restore some of the energy in the jar. But most things that you do are actually going to take the energy out of that jar and pretty swiftly as well. So you might find that the jars of energy is gone. And if you think about you're topping up that art jar of energy overnight, so what do you want to use the jar of energy on or the jug of energy on? Um, if, some, if your jug of energy is going to be empty by 11 o'clock, you've got nothing left in there. So don't plan any in inactivities after 11 o'clock. So I know that sounds a very easy and simplistic way of looking at it, but it's just this concept of what do you want to do with your energy? You've got this limited amount of energy. What do you want to do with it? And there are other ways also of looking at um, trying to conserve or to manage your energy most effectively. Um, and energy can be um, managed by planning your activities. So looking at, you know, when, you, when are you doing things in the week and you're trying to pa plan, pack it all into one part of the week. So trying to plan where best you can. Again, I appreciate that when it comes on suddenly, when the fatigue comes on, it's very difficult to plan anything. But if you have a plan A, have a plan B as well for the time that thinking, you know, like if I've got this much energy, I might be doing this. If, I've, if it's not such a good day, then maybe I need to do something like this slightly differently and activity pacing isn't about not doing things it's not about resting all the time activity pacing is about doing things but in a different way that helps you to use the most efficient use of your energy so well, I'll come on to talk and I know the next speaker is going to talk about exercise which is a really positive way and a very effective way of managing your energy and helping with fatigue as well prioritising your tasks as well, so looking at what, what kind of things are important. If your energy jug is used up by 11 o'clock on something that's really important to you, on something that you really want to do, then that's fine. It just means that there's limited energy for the rest of the things, but you've done the things that are important to you or that you wanted to do. And posture, it's amazing how much um, energy we can use, lose, sorry, out of um, pot, out of a different posture if we're feeling sort of fairly something we're in a position where we're not um, holding our muscles or our muscles aren't able to work in the most efficient way we can actually lose a lot of energy through that means so just start considering your posture when you're sitting are you fairly relaxed you know are you supported when you're sitting um, so just having a think about posture as well and I put permission down here which might be a bit of an odd thing but giving yourself permission to do things in a different way because we're creatures of habit we've done things over time for many years perhaps and we've done things in the same way and as I say activity pacing and managing your energy efficiently might be about doing things slightly differently and giving yourself permission to do things differently as well is really important and the just the little diagrams on the bottom just give a way of just if you don't find the energy jar that helpful just thinking about a battery you know don't let the battery run down to flat so you recharge it giving some time to recharge your batteries the, you know, maybe thinking of your energy as a bank account, so making sure that you've got enough credit in the bank, um, or also the envelope. So there may be days when you've got a big envelope and you can stuff lots of it in there. So there may be days that you've got energy and you can stuff things into that day, but there may be days that you've got a smaller envelope and you're not going to be able to put as much of those things into the envelope. The env envelope's going to rip. So just thinking about the way that you use your energy. And also tell people around you how you're feeling. Because as I think we said earlier on, this isn't the kind of fatigue that's relieved by a good night's sleep. It's the kind of fatigue that goes on and, and has to be managed by doing things differently, which will affect those who are around you. So just thinking about this... It, 
a cycle, if you like, a cycle of deconditioning. Often when you're feeling fatigued and you've got no energy, you don't really feel like doing anything, you feel like when you do the activity, it makes you feel even more exhausted, so then you end up doing less activity, and then that leads to physical and emotional deconditioning as well. You're feeling really <coughs> rotty about things, and then that leads to further reduced reduction in activity. And this can be a very common cycle when you're feeling like you've got differences with your energy levels, when you don't feel like you've got enough energy to do what you want to do. So some of the techniques around planning and prioritising and managing your energy in a different way can help you to actually manage this cycle of deconditioning. But also gradual return or gradual engagement in some activities. So gradually trying to do things um, can help that deconditioning to help with a cycle of reconditioning. So things like trying to set small goals for yourself, achievable things that can help. So, you know, we don't, we're not talking about going out and walking for miles or trying to do too much. As we said, we want to make, manage your energy efficiently, but trying to set some goals so that you can engage in some activities and increase the, the strength and endurance and increase your mental well-being as well which can then lead to a further increase in activity. And this does work because we've, we've seen with people that they can start off very small, even if we're talking about small steps on a, you know, on a, we had somebody who was on a um, cycling machine who was doing a minute at a time, a minute for a couple of days a week, just at a time, and then gradually building that up. So even if you have to start very small and gradually build it up, it's really excellent that you can, if you can get some, some sort of physical activity incorporated into the day. Oops, going the wrong way. And just this idea of just taking it a step at a time so that you're not trying to do massive things. Um, I'm not telling you to eat one, by the way, but, um, but just taking it a small step at a time so that we're doing gradual steps and getting into things gradually so that you can make the most efficient use of that energy. And then we've got a bit of time also to talk about stress management and anxiety management. And again, 10 minutes is a whistle-stop tool, really. But what, we've, what I've tried to do is just, again, to provide some practical strategies that can help with stress and anxiety management. But I think it's also important to note that stress is a normal part of life. We need um, some levels of stress to keep us going because we need that response. It's our flight, fight, flight response, and it protects us from, from any threat that our body perceives. But when it's happening all of the time and when we've got that response going on all of the time, that can wear us out and actually can stop us from functioning at a good level. So learning some strategies to control the symptoms of, of this fight-flight response can be really help to reduce the impact of stress and anxiety. And we all have ways that we deal with stress already. There's always, we all experience it and we all have ways that we um, try and deal with it. But just, this is maybe just a consideration of some things to try and, try and help with that. So firstly, it might be important just to look at trying to, or even just talking to somebody if it helps, but to try and piece apart, pick apart what it is that's actually causing the stress, what's causing the anxiety, because sometimes it can feel like it's appearing in one big lump and it just feels like everything's there. And particularly with something that we've already heard as complex as lupus, there's lots of facets, there's lots of things that are going to be going on for you. So trying to think about what kind of things are making you feel the way that you are you're feeling. So is it about something, you know, I should, should be able to get things done, so I really should be able to do this. Before I was unwell, I was able to do this, and now I'm only able to do this. What's going on? I should be able to do more. How am I going to get everything done at work tomorrow? There's just too much. You're feeling overloaded, just too much there. Um, you want to go out and do things. I want to see everybody, but I just feel so exhausted. So, and taking, you know, I'm taking longer to do things. Everything's taking so much longer. By the time I get out in the mornings, it's 10 o'clock, whereas I was able to get out for 8 um, and this idea, I don't know what's happening to me, um, which might be quite common because sometimes there might be that um, feeling of different things happening and what's going on. 
Um, so trying again to try and tackle some of these individually can help to separate it out so it doesn't feel like quite one big lump. For those of you who've experienced or who are aware of or know about um, cognitive behavioural therapy, this is a technique um, that's used in cognitive behavioural therapy just to try and tease out some of the, the um, issues that you might be experiencing or people who are trying to manage anxiety. Can, it's a, a way of trying to help with that. So the idea of I should be doing this, I should be doing that. When I was, before I was, um, had this condition, I was doing X, Y, and Z. And what we would encourage you to do is say, pick a time point in terms of, you know, like since your diagnosis or since something has happened and just see how much progress you're making. So try not to compare and, and say, I should do. Say, I've got, you know, this amount of energy. I'm actually choosing to do this today. I'm going to choose to do it like this today. And it might sound like it's playing with words, but actually what it does do is it just helps you to put a bit more control back into your life so that you're controlling what you can do more. Um, things about work and about routines or whether it be through school or studying adapting the routines and workload let people know what's going on and trying to adapt the routine so that it can be something that's a bit more manageable for you um, and the thing about I can't exercise it makes me too exhausted well we'll go on to hear that actually exercise Yes, it might make you feel um, tired, it might make you feel breathless, but actually exercise is very good for us and very good for you as well and with anybody with a long-term condition. In the, in the studies, it's actually one of the things that's been found to be most beneficial to actually help out with fatigue. So that's a really important aspect. And again, graded exercises that you're doing things gradually, getting back into things gradually. And then thinking, you know, I'm so tired, my condition must be getting worse. The level of fatigue isn't um, often linked with the le with isn't always sorry linked to the extent of the condition. So it's not always an indicator that condition is worse. So fatigue, as we said at the beginning, is something that will um, inevitably be there as part of life, unfortunately. But it's something that can be managed and can be and there are strategies to help with managing it. So. These things in this vicious daisy, if you like, is um, just a way of picking apart some things and trying to break it down so it feels a little bit more manageable. And we talked a bit about the, the physical energy. So also, the, as you probably well know, there's this mental um, energy as well. Um, trying to do things like um, using a diary to help out, and using when you're going for appointments, noting down things so that you know there might be something on your mind. You come out. How many times did we do that? We actually forget what we went in for. But when you're feeling fatigued and your energy levels are lower, actually it's going to be more difficult to actually remember everything that you want to. Um, trying to cut down on the distractions when you're concentrating so things like switching off a phone or you know like um, telling people that you're trying to concentrate on this one thing for a while that, that's not always possible I know we're living in a world when we get when life is very busy but where possible try and cut distractions using a notepad as say to aid memory sometimes using a photo or an image just for a moment to help with calming and relaxing us can be really helpful just to just to get us to take a bit of time out and we've um, in some studies suggest that for for mental and um, fatigue or cognitive fatigue that uh, using craft art craft activities as we've said or sometimes using a photo that can help to relax us can actually help for a moment to just refresh the mind um, and as we said, their art and craft activities can reduce mental fatigue. So talking about images, <laughs> um, we're just going to stop for a moment um, and do something that's called the three-minute three, um, three minute breathing exercise, which some people may have heard of. And it's from a, um, a mindfulness um, it's actually a mindfulness technique and mindfulness is about trying to focus on the way that you're feeling just here and now so trying not to worry about what went on yesterday or what went on before trying not to be concerned with what you've got to do next you know what have I got to do shopping when am I going to get that cup of tea when are they going to stop talking so we're trying to actually focus on the here and now um, and also what that can do is to help to filter out some of the thoughts that are distracting us or the, some of the thoughts that can um, be negative for us so we're just going to try it now if you don't want to try it that's absolutely fine if you do that would be great as well so it's only just going to take a couple of minutes and what we want you to do is just to stop what you're doing and just notice your posture 
So sit comfortably with your spine straight and your feet flat on the floor. Stack. And you can have your eyes open or closed. And in your mind, ask yourself, how am I? How do I feel? What are my thoughts? Recognise and accept your thoughts, and even if they're unwanted. Now gently direct your attention to your breathing. Notice each breath in and out. As you notice your breaths, focus on the sensation of your breathing, the sensations of your breath as it enters your nose when you start to breathe in until you breathe out. Become aware of your breath traveling through your body and use your breathing to clear your mind and be aware of the stillness. Once you are relaxed, expand your awareness of your breathing to your whole body. Feel any tension or aches and then focus on the sensations as you breathe in. As you breathe out, feel a softening of the sensations for a while. And as best you can, bring this awareness to the next few moments of your day. Okay, I'll try and bring everybody back into the room before we lose you. <laughs> um, that was just, I know that wasn't three minutes, it was less than that, but that was just a simple technique. Um, in, and if nothing else, it does stop us just to, to stop um, and to focus on our breathing. But mindfulness, again, can be a very effective way of helping with managing anxiety. And for anybody who's interested in the image, it's a little place called Skibbereen. It's one of my favourite places in the world, and it's in Ireland. So the three-minute breathing space, again, is about trying to relax your body, trying to breathe, exhale, and trying to filter out some of the thoughts um, in, your, in your mind. <coughs> The other thing, if you find that you're breathing um, quite rapidly, sometimes it's very helpful to focus on just the breath out. So even a sim something as simple as just thinking, just try and focus on the breath out. The breath in will take care of itself. Try and focus on the breath out. Trying to focus on your breathing will actually be really helpful um, in managing anxiety because when you're actually, or when you're getting feelings of acute anxiety and acute panic, <laughs> your breathing rate goes up and it does that as part of that response that we described that your body's trying to use to protect us. Um, which by trying to calm your breathing rate down that can actually try and reduce some of those symptoms. This is another little technique which is using colour. We're not going to do it, I'm just going to give it to you for, to take away. Um, you can replace the colour with anything you want, um, but what it is, it's an idea of a simple technique that can be used um, just to help to calm and to just to relax um, and to help to, again, reduce the sensations of anxiety at times. And we've also used this with somebody who is very into fishing um, and replaced the, the terms and the, the description with something to do with fishing. So choose something that you like doing that's relaxing um, and, and change the words around. And this, again, is another um, little technique, which are all very um, short techniques. And it's not to um, dull down relaxation or, or mindfulness because you can really you can spend a whole talk um, or even a whole day um, talking about relaxation and mindfulness but these again are just snippets of things that can be useful to use and people have used to help with managing anxiety and to help to to calm and, and they're very easy to fit into the day so just thinking about a word that helps you to feel um, calm this one is tranquility and imagining a place that takes you there, a colour, um, what does it smell like, what does it feel like to be there, so you're imagining yourself in that place. And things like this can only, you only have to do for, you can only, um, or only have to do them, say, for about five minutes, um, or even shorter, they're just very short techniques. Thank you for listening.